Uh, I asked Noelle to come because I have worked with her. Uh, she is an OT and a certified hand therapist, which she will explain what that is. I have hand problems. I know a lot of people who have hand problems. And uh, I thought it might be interesting to people to hear from someone who is a professional helping people to deal with hand issues. And with some emphasis on women, but everybody has hand problems. This is true. So um, I did not bring up your bio, but um, lots of lots of experience. And if you ask a PT around here who you should see for your hand, they're going to tell you Noel. Been around a while. <laughs> yeah. And she works at, at the um, Kingston Physical Therapy down in the Kingston Plaza. In the back of that space, they have a hand section. So do you want to go is ahead? And... Part of access or not? Is it what? No. No. Okay, good. I just wanted to know. Thank no, it's you. not part of access. I think it's an independent, isn't it? Yeah, it is an independent. It's one of the few independents left. It's a yeah. Kingston, Kingston Hand Therapy is actually a sister company to Kingston PT. We're housed within um, the same um, building and we're sister companies. And that is more of a legality um, with occupational therapists and physical therapists and how the businesses have to be set up. So we're part of um, Kingston Physical Therapy. A lot of people think that an OT is a person who teaches you how to brush your teeth or something if you've had a stroke and well, some do, but it's a big, it's a much bigger. It's a very diverse field. And when you go from one population to another, it looks like a completely different career. And it is an OT who works in a school system is uh, helping children with attention issues and how to write and cut. Um, somebody who's in a rehab unit or in a hospital might be teaching someone who's had a stroke, how to hold a toothbrush or tie their shoes. If someone's had a hip replacement, you have to learn how to dress yourself without bending past 90 degrees at the hip. So if you'd like to put on socks, shoes, and pants, you need some adaptive equipment, and it's an occupational therapist that shows you how to do that. So it does. It looks very different in every field. Um, in the hand section of an orthopedic outpatient clinic, it looks confusingly similar to a physical therapist, and, um, and that's because we, we kind of overlap. Um, as an OT, I only treat technically shoulder down to the hand. In my current um, office, I really work with the elbow to the hand because when they brought hand therapy in, they had a strong business um, already and they were treating lots of shoulders. So in this particular facility, I haven't treated shoulders. If I've seen more than three shoulders in 10 years, it's a lot. Um, so I really work with the elbow down. Um, I call myself the princess of therapists because um, I only treat from the elbow down to the hand. And there's a lot of work, believe it or not. Um, men and women. And so on. So it can be an, uh, an, a hand therapist can be an occupational or a physical therapist. The majority of us tend to be occupational therapists. Um, and part of that requirement of being a CHT or a certified hand therapist is um, about 4,000 hours of hands-on experience, no pun intended. Um, you have to have at least now it's three clinical years of experience. It used to be five. And then you get to pay an expensive fee and take a test that less than 50% of the people pass when they take it. Um, and then you're considered a certified hand therapist. Um, and there's approximately 7,000 of us in the world, which is not a lot, which is why they actually reduced it from five clinical years of experience down to three. Um, when I go to um, our annual conferences, <clears throat> I'm one of the spring chickens in the group and I'm, I've been around the block a while. I'm not exactly a spring chicken, but I'm one of the younger people at the conference. So we need to do a lot to recruit younger people into the profession. And the interesting thing is at the same time, more of our hand surgeons are becoming very cognizant about having their patients see a certified hand person. I see more people that come in from New York, um, mostly from New York and Westchester, where they're putting them right onto the hand therapy website have it and punch in their zip code and out spits the names of um, local hand therapists um, where years ago, and it's still word of mouth. I mean, we work closely with certain hand surgeons and they say, this is where you need to go. Um, but for guys that are servicing people much farther away from us, that's how they find us is um, on the website. So we don't have a lot of us around and there's an increase in demand. So it's an interesting time for us as a profession. And like everybody else, we can't find anybody to, that wants to join the ranks. <laughs> okay, so as Judy explained, I am in the Kingston Hand Therapy Center down at the plaza. And um, 
Oh, we've been there for, gosh, uh, probably 18 years, I think. Um, I've been practicing for close to 24, I believe. Most of that has been in the outpatient arena, although I have done stints in other areas. Um, the hand therapy clinic is sort of like coming home to me. It's like coming home and putting my, my slippers on. It's um, my place of comfort. Um, thank you for having me tonight to talk about something that I, I truly love to do. I consider myself very fortunate um, to love what I do. Um, I get to meet a lot of interesting um, people and um, learn a lot about um, a lot of other people and, and what they do in their life. This is a little bit about um, what I explained to you about who's a certified hand therapist. And as you can see in the United States, there's just under 7,000 of us um, and not many more of us outside of the US. 86% is made up of occupational therapists. And I actually have one friend who is both an occupational and a physical <coughs> therapist and a CHT. She is what we call an overachiever. They exist. Okay. It is the human hand that we perceive the con the consummation of all perfection as an instrument. This superiority consists in the combination of strength with variety, ah, extent and rapidity of motion and the sensibility which adapted for holding, pulling, spinning, weaving, and constructing. With the hands, a laborer supports a family, the parent loves and cares for a baby, the musician plays a sonata, the blind read and the deaf talk. This is, um, you can tell from some of the spinning and weaving, although it does, still does apply today. This, uh, this fellow is from quite a while ago. He's one of the first um, uh, physiologists, um, but it's certainly, um, our hands are certainly our tools. Um, it allows us to do pretty much everything. I used to be amazed when I worked in a hospital setting, I would hear the discharge planners on the phone saying, oh, so-and-so can ambulate 20 feet. They're ready to go home. And I used to think, well, he, may, he or she may be able to ambulate 20 feet, but they can't undo their pants. They can't you know, utilize the toilet paper. They can't reach it. They can't break it apart. They can't wipe themselves. They can't open a refrigerator door. What are they gonna do? They have no use of anything else but their legs. Um, so it really, it, you need our, we need our legs obviously, but our hands complete the picture. And sometimes um, it, they're sort of like a second class citizen sometimes until um, all of a sudden we realize uh, when we lose the use of them, how much we actually need them. There we go. So within the hand itself, there are 19 bones. You got eight little wrist bones, two forearm bones, three nerves that um, enter into the hand and you have a whole boatload of stuff in there. Um, this is actually one layer of uh, basically five that I just lifted off of one of our educational sheets. There's a lot of structures within a very compact space, and that's what makes it so complicated um, to work with. You have layers upon layers. When you have an injury, if something's torn, if you have to have a surgery, when you go in and you, even if it's repaired, there's scar tissue, that's how we heal. And there's all this stuff is so close together um, the scar tissue is um, probably our, our number one problem. Um, uh, so it, it's, I see a question popping up on the, on the bottom. I'm not sure how to address that, Judy. It says, what about writing? Um, you can answer it now or you can answer it later. Okay. You'll have to help me find that a little bit later. Yeah, it'll be there. Um, okay, thank you. Sorry to interrupt that. Um, so being so small and in compact um, space, um, it, it creates a lot of issues for us. It's, it's always a challenge. And that's the beauty of it too. People always say to me, don't you get bored? And I say, no, I see 10 hand fractures and none of them are the same. They don't present the same. The people don't use their hands the same. Everyone's health is different. It's always something unique. There we go. Um, so again, in my clinic, I see pretty much from the elbow to the hand, mostly adults, um, a handful of children. Children tend to heal really well. Um, when I see a child, it's usually a, a pretty ugly injury. Um, could be a nasty elbow fracture or a complication of having a cast from a, a wrist fracture. Um, but typically they don't do therapy um, or I should qualify that as orthopedic therapy. There are other things that um, children may have that we don't address in our clinic, um, like your developmental stuff. We're really ortho-based. So I see men and women, 
So I see a lot of similar injuries, but they occur very differently. So I'll see fractures in men. I'll see elbows and, and wrist fractures in men, but they tend to be high velocity injuries. These are the guys who are standing on the ladder with their chainsaw, trimming the leaves or trimming the branches off a tree and the ladder kicks out. And by the grace of God, the only injury they get is a wrist fracture because quite honestly, they could kill themselves with the chainsaw. And I see it more than you would want to believe actually happens. Um, ladders are great. Christmas guys stringing Christmas lights is a big one. Um, the, adder, the ladder goes sideways. They go the other way. Um, and falls. I've had uh, several people. Um, one guy was hiking on his honeymoon uh, out West and fell down a cliff. And another guy went to retrieve a Frisbee, the dog, um, somehow managed to, to drop off the side of a massive hillside. And he thought he could reach the favorite Frisbee for the dog. And, um, it didn't work out so well for him. So fractures in men are usually high velocity injuries. Um, another common injury we see, um, are saw injuries, all kinds of saw injuries. It's usually the non-dominant hand. The dominant hand is usually running the saw. Um, there's a few exceptions to that. Um, some other saws that can kind of rotate around and they can use their non-dominant hand, but um, the saving grace of most saw injuries is that it is the non-dominant hand that's impacted. Um, but because it is a trauma and the nature of the trauma, um, we typically see um, it's a combination of um, lacerations, tendon and nerve repairs, fractures, um, amputations. So they're kind of always interesting and unique um, as well. I see a lot of tendonitis in my male population. Um, typically utility workers or musicians, um, your utility, your pole workers, where they're crimping and turning um, repetitively with pressure and musicians, uh, male and female, but, um, you know, awkward postures, a lot of pressure on the hands and prolonged period of times um, in those awkward postures um, is a perfect recipe for disaster. Um, so that's the tendonitis presentation that I typically see in men. And I do see some um, strokes, typically men 50 plus, but not many of those in our, in our setting. And then we come to the women, let me just, all right. So fractures in women are typically, they trip over the sidewalk. Um, maybe they're hiking and they trip over a tree root. Um, you know, they misstep on a curb. It seems to be the everyday and, and it's usually very frustrating. They're usually um, quite annoyed at themselves, you know, how stupid or whatever. The problem is our bone density is, is not so hot um, because we're usually talking about women 50 plus. Um, and then ice and snow is, is also another um, big one for women. So yes, they have fractures. Their fractures are from very different, um, from a very different perspective. Um, I see a lot of arthritis in women, um, finger joints and the CMC joint, which is the base of your thumb which is right here. And we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, I see that more commonly in women. I do see it in men, but significantly more in women. And I have some theories on why that is. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Tendis, uh, tendinitis tends to come in the form of carpal tunnel, trigger finger, decrevains, which is again, up on the, the back of the thumb and then um, lateral epicondylitis. Um, I also see trauma in women, their tendon lacerations, they tend to be less tremendous. Um, not that that's a fair, maybe I should say less significant. Um, you know, they, instead of a big saw, it's usually a knife. It's usually separating frozen hot dogs or bagels, um, taking that last brownie out of the pan with a knife and they miss the, the, the brownie or they shoot through the brownie and they cut their tendon in the hand on the other side. Um, the other big one is um, pressing glass. They're compressing glass. So somebody will break a glass, they'll put it in the garbage, they'll forget it's there and they'll go to compress the garbage down and they lacerate their tendons and nerves. And we've seen that quite a bit or even washing glasses. Um, so when a woman has a trauma, it tends to look uh, more that way. The other big one is peeling avocados. Um, that seems to be a favorite way to, um, to cut a tendon. Um, Mike. Absolutely, who's, got, who's saying something? I said, yike. Oh, yikes. Okay. Um, the other thing I see with women um, uh, more, I'm going to, I labeled it as pain, as a generic pain, because we tend to have more soft tissue injuries. So there's no concrete um, diagnosis. Um, and then we also have issues with fibromyalgia and also um, pain syndromes, which are um, complications that arise from other injuries. 
much more prevalent in women than men. Um, so that's another whole ball of wax. All right. So in my wrist breaks for women, um, it's typically, typically your distal radius, which is the bone that joins up to the bottom of your thumb on that side of your wrist. Um, there are three ways to treat a fracture. You can have it um, just have them reposition it. It's called closed reduction. There's no surgery and casted. Um, open reduction internal fixation is when they open you up and put some plate and screws in there. And external fixation, I don't really see much of that anymore. I mean, quite honestly, when I see an external fix it, fixator, it's generally on men. That tends to be um, a, a male falling off a roof is, is pretty much when I've seen it. Um, it just holds the bones in position so that it allows the bone to fill in while it's healing. Um, we don't see them that often, um, which is a good thing because on a forearm, um, they're horrible looking um, and very difficult for the patient to function on a daily basis. So closed reduction and um, open reduction, internal fixation with plates and screws, um, and sometimes um, just metal pins too. 80% of um, the force that we put through our hands comes through the radial column. That's the thumb side of your, of your hand and forearm. Um, when you have a wrist fracture, it's typically pain, swelling, loss of movement, loss of strength, and um, loss of dexterity. It's also not uncommon for folks to develop carpal tunnel syndrome after a wrist break. Um, I wouldn't say it's common, but it's certainly not uncommon. And that can be because those tiny carpal bones with a fall, they can shift just a little bit to make that canal a little bit smaller. There's swelling. Sometimes it result, you know, numbness resolves. Sometimes they have to go on to have a release done. Um, Let's see, um, out of this. So there was a study done out of, um, let's see, those with uh, wrist fractures. Oh, so there's been some studies done where they follow women that have wrist fractures. And unfortunately, um, there's a significant functional decline in folks um, who have wrist fractures versus those who have not had wrist fractures in terms of functional use, which kind of makes sense. You know, you can develop arthritis, you never get the full range of motion back but those people were 50% more likely to see a significant functional decline. The other big thing is that um, if you look down at the bottom of the screen, UCLA study, these are large studies. This is like over 6,000 women. Um, and, and it has to do with our bone density. Uh, one in five who experienced a broken wrist went on to suffer a non-wrist fracture. So you're gonna have a fracture someplace else over the next 10 years. And that had, tends to, like I said, have to do with the bone density. Um, so um, these are some concerns for us. This is also, like I said, it's all tied in though. This is why women break their wrist tripping over a, a curb or an uneven sidewalk. Um, it, it all boils down to the same thing and that's the condition of our bones. Um, so we need to try to figure out how to maximize and, and take precautions and what can we do to, uh, to, to minimize our risk for sure. Okay, so. Um, well, we can't wrap ourselves in bubble wrap to prevent a wrist fracture, that's for sure. Um, we know that weight-bearing exercise is good for us. Um, probably a good idea to know your bone density, to know if you're at risk. Um, if you're going to do a sport like snowboarding or rollerblading, you know, um, have wrist guards. If you're going to go hiking, make sure you have the appropriate shoes. Um, you know, it sounds silly. It helps. Is it going to completely stop it? No, but at least you've done what you can. Um, a healthy diet and um, some calcium and some vitamin D. Um, and towards the end, I have some thoughts on, on food and diet and supplements and that kind of stuff. Okay. So the next thing we're gonna talk about that I see a lot um, for women is, is the arthritis. And if you look at the diagram on the left, you'll see um, little bumps. So the, the joint next to your fingernail um, that's one particular, that's a little osteo, um, fight developing. They can be very tender when they first come out. Um, I actually have some on my hands. So I, I, sometimes I'll put, um, like little gel, uh, we in the clinic, we have these little gel sleeves and I just pop them on there so that if they get bumped, they don't, they're not as tender. Um, and then of course the middle joint can also have those nodes and, and that tends to, um, turn when people have those nodes on their fingers, sometimes they're going to find that on their fingertips, um, they can get like a little twisty looking. 
um, some more significant than others. You might lose your range of motion, how much you can bend your fingers or how much you can straighten your fingers. Um, and then if you look down at the bottom, the CMC joint, that's a big one. Um, and for women um, in particular, I do see men who get that. Uh, women get it um, disproportionately more for sure. So that, that CMC arthritis um, at the base of your thumb, um, as females with our reproductive hormones, um, I have always said, thought that um, it has played an impact. You know, everything loosens up once a month. We have, we're hyper ligamentous. And if you think about how we use our hands, we're very hand-based. Uh, think more gross motor for men. Of course, that might be a little biased at this point with, with technology, but in general, women have always been the fine motor people. Um, think crafting and, and typically writing and, and more computer um, men, are doing more computer stuff now, but um, so we're a little bit more prone just by our activities. And then you throw in um, our hormones and then um, which make everything loosey goosey once a month, which means those bones are rocking on surfaces that are not necessarily meant for those bones to be rocking on. And it leads to a degradation of the joint. Um, and of course, age, you know, uh, it's like a car, you use it often enough and things wear out and that's just the way life is. Um, the thumb, when you pinch your thumb and your, your pointer finger together, if you're pinching a pound of strength at the tip, that force is 12 times greater at the base of the thumb. So this really takes, um, the, the base of your thumb really takes um, a hit when we're, we're pinching. Um, and then a grasping, um, you're talking about almost, almost 265 pounds of compressive force through that thumb. Um, and our thumb is what allows us to oppose our fingers. That's really what's functional. If you take your thumb away, you're, you will find uh, you are incredibly limited in your function and um, 40 to 50% of impairment when you lose your, your thumb. So this is, um, this is a big one. And this is, I would say out of 10 people that come through the clinic, probably nine are female that have this. This is a big deal for us. So you will find that I broke things down into um, uh, sort of management strategies. So your first line of defense um, or the most conservative approach to, to arthritis of the thumb is um, therapy. We work on um, pain management. We work on strengthening. These are very tiny muscles. Um, it takes a while for these muscles to be strengthened up. Um, so you support, you, you're trying to strengthen up the muscles that surround that thumb joint. Um, it can be, I find for women of more advanced age, it might buy you some time. It depends on how you use your hands. It depends on your age, your health. Um, for younger folks that might be musicians, they tend to respond well because they're younger and they've caught it really at an earlier stage. Typically, um, we look to splint, um, folks, uh, and you can see there's a range of splints up here, you know, this kind of splint splint is worn at night to really rest the thumb. Um, and these are two different um, splints for functional, uh, for functional use. So during the day, you might have these on to support that joint. So you're not doing more damage to the joint while you're using your hand. Um, we don't want to overuse the splints because when you, it allows the joint to rest, but it doesn't allow you to use your muscles. So there's sort of a balance just like everything else in life, I suppose. Um, the next step up from therapy is a cortisone injection. Again, for some folks, it might be enough. It depends on how bad the damage is in there. And the third is called arthroplasty. There's several soft tissue techniques where they actually, um, at the base of your thumb, uh, where this long bone comes down, you have a teeny tiny carpal bone that sits at the base. And in the worst case scenario, that little tiny bone is usually pulverized. So they usually remove that bone. They, um, they harvest your palmaris longus um, which is a, a sort of a spare tendon, if you will, that comes down your hand. They split it in half and they, um, several options, but they basically use half of the tendon to stabilize um, that bone. They drill a hole through your metacarpal and um, thread this tendon through. And then the space that they remove that tiny carpal bone, they roll up the tendon, uh, the other half of the tendon, and they stuff it in that space and it scars down and it holds the space. And it's quite an effective uh, technique. It takes about three months um, for someone to heal from that. I would say most people somewhere around week 
somewhere between week six and eight have decided that the surgery is definitely worth having up to that point in time, they still have pain, they have swelling, um, and they have minimal or significant loss of use of their hand. So they're kind of like, why did I bother having the surgery? And somewhere the, the, the switch flips between six and eight weeks where they feel like, Hey, I can fill in the blank. Um, for men, it's usually cutting their nails. Um, you know, those, there's certain big things for women. It might be, um, you know, tweezing their eyebrows. Um, so there's different activities that they can start to do that they haven't been able to do in a long time. And that's sort of the turning point, but I would say people are with me for probably 12 weeks after they have a surgery for this. Um, if that's what they have to go to, but they usually don't have the surgery until they're in so much pain, they can't take it anymore. Okay. So if you have the arthritis that we talked about where you have the little bumps on your um, tips, the joints of your finger, these are some basic range of motion exercises um, that can just keep you limber. One thing that everybody does, we're absolutely amazing at compensating. So when we lose something, we don't even necessarily know it right away we just start to change how things um, and we do it in the slightest way. And then it becomes a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And what's happening is um, we, to the point where we compensate, we don't even realize until I bring you into the clinic and I ask you to do specific movements, then they start looking at their other hand or, well, can you do that? Am I supposed to be able to do that? Because they've gone um, so long without being able to do something. So just some quick, simple exercises, you know, fingers apart and together again, palm down on a table, lifting your finger up and something we call tendon glides. And that's just basic range of motion and movement of your fingers. Um, so it's a nice way to, um, this is, this is like the basic home exercise program that probably 99% of the people in my clinic will get. Um, this is, um, like I said, the very basic for range of motion. Trying to switch slides here, but I don't know why I can't. You did. You want the tendonitis slide, right? Judy, can you hear me? Yeah, you've got the tendonitis slide up. Isn't that what you want? Uh oh. I think she lost. Mm -mm. Noel, you're, you're, you're muted. There we go. Okay. Sorry about that. How long was I down before? Uh, I thought just, I got a, before. just a minute or so, but this is the slide you wanted, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Great. All right. So the next big thing I see, um, again, I see it with men and women, certainly far more common in women than men. Um, so under tendonitis, carpal tunnel, um, in your, um, well, we'll go through the anatomy in a second, but you have, you have carpal bones on one side of your wrist, and then you have these nine flexor tendons that come through and it surrounds the median nerve. And, um, and then you have this nice tight piece of um, ligament. It's almost like a piece of um, saran wrap that holds the tendons in place. So when the nerves become inflamed, they have no place to go. So they expand and they compress the nerves um, and then you experience pain, numbness, and eventually weakness. Um, this can be from repetitive use. Most people know it from computers, but um, people who work cash registers. Um, the other two big ones are um, pregnant women. I think that's just global swelling is what causes it for them. And also motor vehicle accidents. Um, a quick stretch back on the wrists um, will inflame the tendons as well. And the same thing, um, the first line of, of defense is um, therapy. We work on pain management. Sometimes we splint. We work a lot on activity modification. Sometimes we actually have people wear a splint during the day so they can see the activities that are difficult for them to do with that brace on. And that gives us an idea of what might be triggering it for them. The other thing is if pain is greater in the morning than it is um, through the rest of the day, it's probably from sleep positioning. Um, so you're flexing your wrists at night and you don't even realize it. So sometimes just by wearing a splint overnight can alleviate some of these um, symptoms um, if that's truly the cause. Let me, can, yeah. do you have control? 
It doesn't seem like it. I can't seem All to right, access it. Let me see if I can bring it back here. And, Thank you. Uh, I don't know why it took it off, but it did. Here you go. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, and so there's the, the picture of the carpal bones on the bottom, those tendons coming through and then the nerve. And you'll see that what looks like in this picture to be this thin white line is that nice saran wrap of a, a ligament that holds everything in there nice and tight. Sometimes they'll do a cortisone injection as the next line of defense. If you fail, if you fail therapy, then cortisone injection, and then of course, surgery. And that can either be um, an open where they open you right up or they go through with, um, with arthroscopically. A um, lot of debate on arthroscopic surgery. Some, yes, it's less scarring. It's, you know, quicker healing, blah, blah, blah. The bottom line is they still cut the transverse carpal ligament. And so there's still an internal amount of healing that has to happen. So while the external scar is smaller, the internal um, healing is, is the same. And my bias is that when they go in arthroscopically, they can't visualize the entire length. Their vision is very limited. I actually observed this surgery. It's about 20 minutes of prep and three seconds of a surgery. They go in and they, um, they visualize that transverse carpal ligament and then they cut it and that's it. All you can see is that transverse carpal ligament. When they open you up completely, they can follow the length of the nerve up into your hand and down into your forearm because we are all unique and we all have diff slightly different anatomies. And so if you're getting hung up in multiple places, they can, they can see it and release it. Um, in fact, for a long time, and I believe still to this day, workers comp will not approve arthroscopic carpal tunnel release. They insist on it being open for that very reason. So mm -hmm. arthroscopic sounds all great and, and, and dandy, but um, personally, I think open in the bigger picture is, is the better of the two surgeries if you ever have to have one. And, and the surgeons have their own bias. You know, Some only do arthroscopic, some will only do open. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Every, everybody's got an opinion. Ah, and trigger finger. So trigger finger is another inflammation. Um, so we have these flexor tendons that allow us to bend our fingers. Um, and what happens is in order to bend the finger without the tendon bow stringing, we have to have something hold those tendons um, to the bone. And that's where our pulleys come in place. And um, the first pulley, which is our A1 pulley, um, and A stands for annular. It's just, it's circular versus if you see on the screen, um, these are your cruciate ligaments, they're crisscross, right? So annular is just this uh, ligament that goes around. So, um, and it's the first pulley. So it becomes, the, it's the A1 pulley. And what happens is the tendon has to slide through as you bend your finger, has to come through these little sheets, these pulleys. When the tendon becomes inflamed, it doesn't fit through the pulleys well. Think of trying to put on a dress two sizes too small over your head. And that's about what it's like to try to get a flexor tendon through a pulley. It doesn't work well. Sometimes people will get like little bumps or nodules at the base of their hand. And that's the, the tendon kind of rumpling up as it's trying to um, come through that sleeve. Now, Functionally, as we use our hand, we're stronger in grip. Everything we do is in a grip uh, position, right? That's where all our strength lies. So you can bend your finger and then it gets stuck and it's very painful to open it up. Um, and it's, it, this is one of those things where, oops, is that you? That was me. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I thought I hit something. I'm not even touching. The no, keyboard. I was trying to move the box of people's pictures so that it wasn't covering the slide. Ah, okay. And I hit the wrong spot. <laughs> you hit the wrong button. <laughs> um, so these can be in any finger. Um, they might be more common in the middle and ring fingers, um, but they uh, we've seen them in every finger. I don't even necessarily say there's a favorite. Um, it, it affects pretty much every finger. This can be caused from uh, a lot of different reasons. And sometimes we don't even know why it happens. Um, you can have somebody who has arthritis and it, they're they just have high amounts of inflammation in their system. Um, also people who are diabetic sometimes um, as a, a byproduct of um, their condition, there's extra collagen sometimes. Anything that makes that tendon thicken um, can cause this. Postmenopausal women who um, are uh, 
breast cancer, postmenopausal breast cancer patients who take exemestane, I believe is the one that I can get to my, my brain at the moment, horrible, horrible trigger fingers. And I've seen people almost have difficulty walking because it impacts their joints so bad, but trigger finger is one thing that they also get. So sometimes medication. Um, and like I said, there's a lot of reasons we really don't understand why it happens. It is horrible to treat conservatively. Um, uh, quite honestly, with my folks who have medication issues, sometimes they have to take a medication vacation. Um, it is the only relief they get because anything I do for them is really temporary. And that's frustrating for both of us. Um, so it's, um, we do think repet again, repetitious movement, those tendons, you know, are inflamed. Sometimes people with carpal tunnel, those tendons are inflamed all the way up the line, right? So if the tendons are inflamed, it's not uncommon to see trigger finger with carpal tunnel as well. Um, what else? Therapy, like I said, is not particularly successful with this. Um, really the only people that, um, I will see is somebody who no longer has the pain or they've had the injections, but they're stiff. They've lost movement. Um, it's tough to treat, or if somebody's not a surgical candidate, um, and, and it, it's a long time to treat it. And it's, I would say minimal to moderate success conservatively, unless we can get them really early, which doesn't typically happen. Um, and my line to people is don't come to therapy, just get the injection and then come see me or get the surgery and then come see me. Um, it's that miserable. And I'm a therapist. That's my toolbox, right? Therapy. But this is just one, um, bugger of a, of a process. So it doesn't seem like much people say, Oh, it's only a trigger finger. And I'm like, Oh, well, it's a little more than just a trigger finger. It's, it's a persnickety diagnosis at best. Okay. Decor veins is another inflammation and that's, um, on the tendon on, um, Oh, sort of the side of your thumb as it meets the wrist right here. These little tiny numbers represent um, sleeves. You have um, dorsal compartments on the back of your wrist and um, they hold tendons in a very specific line um, or location to allow the proper function of that tendon, right? So that's why we have to have them. Um, sometimes people, um, we've had people that have an extra tendon come through this slip because again, we, we can have some anatomical differences. Um, again, an inflammation, it could be um, usually from pinching and twisting, um, sometimes uh, with some wrist movement in there. We see this a lot with, um, uh, you'll see it with linemen, you'll see it with um, moms and, and new moms and new grandmoms. When they lift a baby, the way they lift, they flex their wrist at 90 degrees to pick the baby up under um, the armpits. And, and that repetitious thumb stress with the wrist flexion will sometimes cause this as well. So this is um, the same thing. Therapy is always about trying to reduce the pain. And we do that through different modalities. Um, could be electrical stim, it could be um, ultrasound, it could be kinesio taping. We do a lot of soft tissue work, um, possibly splinting. And again, activity modification. If we can identify what the cause is, that is the best way to, to get rid of the, the pain and the issue um, is to modify um, the activity that's causing the problem. If we can't get it, um, folks go for cortisone injections and sometimes those can be helpful. Um, and then again, surgery will release this compartment right here. The problem with surgery for these, the tricky part of surgery with these, it, again, it doesn't look like a massive surgery, but right underneath this tendon lies the dorsal radial sensory nerve. And remember, anytime you cut into somebody, you're going to create scar tissue. That's how we heal. If that scar tissue adheres to that tiny dorsal radial sensory nerve, um, it's incredibly painful. Um, and that's a complication that can, and sometimes does occur with this surgery. So again, it doesn't look like a, a massive surgery, but there's all sorts of things that can and unfortunately uh, do go wrong. Some people proliferate scar tissue like nothing I've ever seen and other people, nothing, uh, bare, bare minimum um, and everything in between. Um, and so those are the most common um, tendonitis that we see in, in women as a general rule of thumb. All right, so some random thoughts. Um, overall health does matter. Um, studies come out over and over again about sleep and diet. 
Um, if anybody reads anything about functional medicine, um, we understand more now about how the gut, what we put into our body, what it does to our gut, um, it impacts um, the body's uh, inability to keep certain things out of our, our body, right? We have these little tight junctures in our, in our um, stomachs and when certain foods pass through them, um, they create um, autoimmune um, issues for us. They create pain issues for us. Um, all these things that we have, we're starting to tie more and more into diet um, and our soils are poor. So while you can eat a good diet, that's important. Um, we're not, always, our food doesn't always have the vitamins and minerals that we used to have in our soil, right? So sometimes supplements can be beneficial. Um, as I get older and I see it every day in the clinic, um, we get hurt, something hurts, ah, it'll go away, it'll get better. And then three months later, six months later, it still hasn't gone away and it still hasn't gotten better. And, um, and nowadays um, it's taking almost four months to get into a, a hand doc at least. And I'm, I'm sure the other doctors aren't much better. Um, so if you're having an issue, get in to see someone. And if it's a hand issue, I would highly encourage you to see a hand doctor. Your general practitioner has a general knowledge. The hand is complicated. And if you can, you want to see someone that that's what they specialize in. Um, I've seen people lose a lot of time um, and unfortunately have some significant consequences when they lose time um, for a proper diagnosis. Our doctors are very busy today. I'm sure all of you are aware of it. They were busy before the pandemic and they are 10 times worse now. Um, I didn't know that. Leslie, your father was a hand surgeon? How cool is that? Um, so, you know, when you go to a doctor and whether it's a hand surgeon or any other doctor, have a very specific list of what activity or movement hurts, specifically where it hurts. The more specific you can be to your physician, you're helping them. They're running through a, a, they're running through a list. When somebody comes to me, they say, my hand's numb. Well, where is it numb? Is it the top side of your hand or is it the palm side of your hand? What fingers? Um, you, you tell me one thing and I'm going to come back with you with five other questions because it helps me narrow down what I'm looking at and they're the same and they have less time with you than I do. Um, is it worse? You know, does time of day matter? Does activity matter? And the description of the pain that you're having um, because burning indicates nerve, you know, where a dull ache might, might mean something else is going on um, or sharp. You know, those things tell us a little bit. They're all clues as to what might be going on. And it's your body. Um, they can't read your mind and um, they need your help um, to diagnose. And they have, you know, what, 3.5 minutes now to see somebody. So if you can come in with a list of, of um, what's going on and rattle it off to them, it's beneficial to both of you. Um, if you take medications, do not ask your physician, ask your pharmacist. That's what they're schooled in. The doctor I, I feel like the doctors know what the, what the um, drug salesman tells them. The pharmacist goes to school and knows the impacts um, of your medications. And so some of these um, side effects can be very rare. Um, they may not be so rare. Um, your, your pharmacist is your friend. Um, get to know them and talk to them. Um, and the, the other, the last thought I had, um, we all have, especially in the last two years, have been on the computer more and more, even if you don't wanna be, you have to be to function these days. So we're all in this very rounded posture over a keyboard. And as um, laptops have become much more um, prevalent, um, our posture has become even worse because we're not situated necessarily. And I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm in a horrible station right now, but this is what most of us are doing. So. Um, Posture is important. Exercise is to pull our shoulders out and back. Frequent stretches. A rest break doesn't mean you have to stop what you're doing. It means stand up for a few minutes while you're keyboarding. If you have the high low tables um, where you can do that, stretch, stretch your arms, get up and move your legs. Um, move, move, move. We are all becoming rounded posture and everything kind of starts from up there. As soon as you can pull your shoulders back and strengthen that up, um, that's a help right out of the gate. Um, and one of our friends here, I think it was a gardener, 
and I, I had a thought, um, if you're having problems with your hands, in general, um, larger diameter tools, whether it's garden tools, whether it's a knife, um, whether it's arthritis with, you know, using a larger diameter pen, it's a little less stressful on the joints. Um, and I think that's it. Does anybody have any questions? There are a few in the, uh, in the chat. I'm going to stop share. Okay. I know I asked one, which is, are there hand doctors who are not surgeons? Oh. Not that I'm aware of. That's interesting. Well, unless the doctors that I all uh, that I work with are all surgeons. And uh, there's one, but he's not a hand guy. He's a general ortho and he's um, semi-retired and he might actually have retired very recently. Um, I don't, he wasn't doing um, operations, but that's because he was kind of getting on in the years. So he wouldn't do any more surgeries. But yeah, everyone I work with is a surgeon. Somebody asked, um, who was it? What about writing? I did. In terms of when we, that first slide, it talks about weaving and other things, but what about the basic, you know, I think of my hand and writing I, I, and eating is two, two very important things that the hand does. It certainly it was does. Meant that, uh, that quote was from um, one of the first physiologists in, in the 1800s. And I was laughing because you could see the spinning and weaving, even though people still do it today. Um, you can tell it was written in, in old time, certainly more today. I mean, between electronic devices and writing, zippering, buttoning, hooking, you name it, we need those tools. Um, we need our hands and that's, that's our tools for sure. Thank you. Can I, can I uh, ask about, um, I don't know if I'm saying it, or do, do Putrin's contraction? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Is it, do you, um, would therapy help that not, as opposed to surgery? Can you okay, avoid so, surgery by having hand therapy? Um, as a general rule of thumb, a Dupuytren's contracture is most common in men of Northern European descent, although we do see a few women. Um, I believe women that we see it with, it tends to be a little bit more aggressive. Um, in terms of conservative management, studies do not support um, the use of conservative um, treatment with it. It doesn't, um, it doesn't work. The only time I've treated anyone conservatively was a gentleman who had a business and he just needed to get through the summer months. I think it was a landscape business. So we did um, uh, a hand splint for him to try to maintain um, so he wouldn't lose any more until he could have the surgery six months out from that time frame. But studies do not show that it is a long-term um, effective treatment. Um, currently you can do, um, there's some folks who do uh, an injection and then there's the open palm technique for surgery. Um, those are, are tried and true. The, the injections are a little brutal, but if you're not a surgical candidate, um, you know, it gets the job done, but it's just as painful. Um, is, it, is it genetic? Because uh, both my, this is my husband has it, not me. Yeah. And both his, his father had surgery and his older brother had, has had surgery on their hands. Yeah, typically it, it is. Yeah. And like I said, men of Northern European descent, the biggest, I mean, it, it's not just them, but that's our biggest, that's a, that's a typical profile. So yeah, we'll often have people say, oh yeah, my grandfather had it or my brother has it or um, very common mm -hmm. you know, for sure. And most people, a lot of men don't um, get the surgery until the fingers are really down mm -hmm. to the palm. So this, the Unfortunate part of that is if it's taken a long time for that to happen, a lot of times the joints are um, really stuck down, but they wait until it's very functionally limiting. Like they can't get their wallet out of their back pocket. Um, they can't shake hands. Um, and when it starts to really get in the way, that's when they seek the, the surgery. But um, it's hard because now the condition of the skin from being flexed for so long is, is not so good. And the condition of the joints um, suffer as well. So it's one of those things where it's like, you don't want to run in, you know, jump into surgery quickly, but you know, somewhere around here is where I think people might want to start thinking about the benefits of a surgery. Um, and of course that's a conversation to have with, with a hand surgeon, but. Linda, Lisa asked as a small child up to today, it always bothered my hands to hold a hand of cards. 
never pain, but quite a bit of discomfort, what would that be? So he's in this thumb area here. And now he's kind of in the dark. Um, is it at the base of the thumb, Lisa? Um, it's just kind of, yeah, in the base, and in the back. front front and back, back and front. front. No, but, even as, but even as a child? But yeah. That's why I don't like to play cards to this day. And even if I grab like a, I can't hold a whole ream of paper. And it's not excruciating. It's not debilitating. But if I have my thumb this way for too long, if I'm on my phone too much, mm -hmm. it's the biggest thing now. It always, it's just sort of a dull ache or something, but it's always been that way. And I've never really thought about it until today. <laughs> um, that's kind of interesting because it throws me off that it's been um, since you were a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have um, rheumatoid arthritis or anything, right? No, yeah. generally it makes, good so health. When, it, when it goes on from a childhood like that up, that's um, unusual. So I, I don't know. I don't know without looking or trying to. <laughs> right figure that out. It's hard that there's no <laughs> quick answer on that one. Okay. Sid wrote question for later. Yeah. Sid, do you want me to take it now? Uh, I could just ask her directly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. For sure. Yeah. You mentioned before about the aromatase inhibitors and I was, I've been on it for five months and I wake up one day and I can't use my thumb and my yeah. finger. And I go to a, I went to a, a spinal person or whatever and they're like, oh, it's arthritis. And I'm like, how do you wake up with arthritis in one day? And then I went to my oncologist and he said, oh yeah, everybody gets this. And I'm in complete pain and I have to be on these medications for five to 10 years. And I've only been on them for a couple of months. And now they're changing me to a mestatine. And now you're saying that, that you've seen the same problems with that. And I don't know, I don't know how to live. <laughs> um, I think the most frustrating part of that, um, and I learned this from a patient, um, uh, I had several patients in a row and I was like, wait a second here, what's going on? Um, highly frustrating, but in the research it's recognized and actually the research on it, it's kind of crazy because they talk about um, uh, people not necessarily complying with medication because of the crappy side effects. Mm -hmm. um, and it's known, but for some reason the, the attitude seems to be while well, you're alive and we're not really worried about quality of life. We've gotten to the point where we're keeping people alive and yet the quality of life doesn't really seem to be addressed. These drugs have been around for a while. Um, nobody seems to be looking at that. It's frustrating. I had a woman come in with multiple trigger fingers and actually it was her thumb. And um, she came in crying, begging me to see her. And I was like, you need to go to a walk-in center and get a cortisone injection. Not knowing at that point, her history. It was later when she would come back to me um, and it, helped, but we would get, we, we would be able to get her relief in, in bursts of periods of time. So it was, she would get a little bit of a rest from it, but at some point she actually had to take a, a vacation from the medicine. And this is a woman who, when she first started this, um, it was interesting. She could, she'd have a hard time getting in and out of her chair, right? Cause it also impacted for her, her hips and, and it would trigger her thumbs. And it was all from this medication. And when she stopped the medication, it was amazing. She would get up and down out of her chair like she was 20 years old. And yet literally two weeks before I'm helping her up because she can't get out of the chair. So um, these are things that um, I see. I don't see anything on the horizon for them trying to do something about it. Um, and I know that what we do in the clinic is short lived um, and it's pretty frustrating. Um, like I said, for everybody, because we know the source of it. Um, but it's been confirmed. Um, you know, it's, it's available in the research. If you look it up, you'll, you'll see it. I just can't live like this for 10 years. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> Thank I, you. I, I, I wish I had a solution. It's frustrating. Susan Metzger had a couple questions and then that's probably it for the evening because we're just about out of time. Okay, great. One question. Okay. The first question is you said that doctors have like three to five minutes for you for the patient. Would we be able to schedule an appointment with you first to get our questions in line? I mean, does uh -huh. that well, does that work? Here, so here's the crazy part. Um, as an occupational therapist, um, you have to have a prescription to see me, right? Right. Um, and the physical therapists do not. It's, it's kind of crazy. I coach my my patients oh. when they're going to doctors. I coach them on how to put. You know, this is what you need to do put your list together of your concerns, your pains, what helps, what makes it worse. 
and try to have as much as possible in front of you when you go to them. Um, and that's honestly almost any doctor at this point, uh, you know, they're humans too. They're trying to make the most of their time. If the first time you're collecting your thoughts is when you're in their office, um, it's not good. Cause that means that time is being eaten up by your, you're trying to think, and then you're under pressure to come up with what it is. And of course we all leave and we think of 10 other things we should have said. Um, we all do it. Um, so the more you can put together before you walk in the door, the better off you're going to be. And the, and the more it's going to be helpful to the physician. Have you ever thought of doing online coaching for people? I have not. And if, if you knew how much <laughs> Judy had to hold my hand through this Zoom presentation. <laughs> You're doing great. <laughs> and my one comment is there's no sort of illness that I'm treating that I know of, but I've been working on balance, posture, and movement. So hopefully those things will help me from not you know, breaking my wrist and stuff. You, anything like yoga and that stuff is really, really good for us. You've got weight bearing, you've got balance. Um, a lot of myofascial stuff goes on with all that stretching. Those are great things and they can be modified typically. So Thank stay you. active ladies. That's so good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank it was you. a pleasure to be with you all. Yes, Thank, Thank you. you. Really informative. <clears throat> yeah. Great job. Great job.